Good morning, York Memorial. Good morning. How are you this morning? I greet you in the only name that ultimately matters. The name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. You do know he's worthy. You do know that he is an awesome God. And we hear people talk about awesome cars, awesome clothes, awesome houses, awesome sales at the department store. But the truth of the matter is awesome is that which inspires all, which inspires worship. So ultimately, God is the only one who is truly awesome. Amen. I am so very blessed to have this opportunity to celebrate Resurrection Sunday with this marvelous congregation. Amen. I want to thank God for this distinguished presiding elder who, amen, that's right, he is. who is one who I have been privileged to call friend for many years. I remember him when he had hair. <laughs> and uh, he has always been a dynamic preacher and just a wonderful person. Thank God for his soulmate and partner in life, Sister Jacobs. Amen. 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 And I want to thank God for your pastor, Pastor DeAndre James Daniel. Amen. Uh, he is, as he's indicated, uh, my son in the ministry, and I'm so very proud of him. I love him deeply. Uh, doesn't mean I still don't have to get on him from time to time. But you know how it is with your children. You love them. Amen. And I love him as if he were my own biological son. And it's because I've seen him mature so greatly. And as much as I appreciate that wonderful introduction and him sharing uh, the personal uh, relationship that we have, um, I tell you what bless me all the more, and I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this, but I ran into his mother-in-law in the airport yesterday in Charlotte, and uh, we talked for a while, and then she said to me that she loves her son-in-law, and that he is an outstanding father and husband. And for me, that was the greatest testimony and so when you talk about exceeding me at my age, because of the kind of father and husband you are, you have already excelled as a man. And we ought to celebrate men who are good fathers. To the First Lady of York, Sister Natalie, and a man. I heard a whoop whoop go Marvelous music ministry. Haven't they blessed us today? Amen. Amen. I kept turning around to look at them because the sound that was coming to me sounded angelic. And so I kept turning around, and lo and behold, there are angels. Amen. Here in the pulpit and in the choir loft. To all of the preachers who share with us, both in the pulpit as well in the pews and to this York family. This has been an inspirational worship experience. And I want to say to these young people, thank you for sharing your gifts and your energy in the life of worship. You are a blessing. And to, uh, to the membership of York, I want to congratulate you uh, because you refuse to marginalize our young people. You have wisely understood that our youth cannot be sat on the back benches and told to wait until 
until they get older. They are not just the church of tomorrow. They must be an integral, active part of the church today. And I thank you, York, for getting that, for understanding that. And also, it takes those of us who are older being willing to be a little more uncomfortable in church in order to create space for young people. Now, I know you don't have this problem in York, but uh, I oversee a hundred more churches, East Coast to West Coast. I'm the only bishop that presides over churches on the Father's East Coast and the Father's West Coast. So I preside from sea to shining sea. And I know you don't have this problem here in York, but in some of our churches, we have some of our older saints who are so determined to keep things like they used to be that they're willing to run young people away from the church just so they can keep things comfortable. But any of you have grandchildren? And have you noticed that when the grandchildren are over, you've got to loosen up a bit for the grandchildren? You notice that sometimes you'll start acting in ways that you wouldn't act when the grandchildren are over? Because you love your grandchildren enough that you're willing to become a little uncomfortable so that your grandchildren will connect with you. Amen. We have to make our churches places where our young people feel welcome. Amen. And so that means sometimes we're gonna be a little uncomfortable because we don't always like the music that they sing and sometimes things get a little loud and sometimes it's just not as in order as we would like it to be. But when you think about the alternative and, le and letting our young people drift onto the streets and not being in the church, isn't it worth being a little uncomfortable so that our young people can feel welcome in the church? And so I want to celebrate you, York, for understanding that and embracing these young people because my heart was leaping for joy as we saw these young people sharing in the worship service on this morning. I want to thank God for my wife who is just my partner in life and partner in travel. We spend so much time going, um, but she is always right there by my side, and so I'm grateful for her once again being with us today. I want to share with you two passages of scripture. If you have your Bible, so I'm going to give you a moment to get there, because I always like to uh, encourage people to seek the scripture for themselves. And so the first scripture is found in Mark, the gospel according to St. Mark. Mark is the second of the four gospels. So if you get to Matthew, the second one will be Mark. And even though Mark is the second in, um, in the chronological order of the canon, it is actually the earliest of the Gospels. Thank God for all of these uh, preachers. Uh, uh, Reverend uh, Catherine, good to see you, sir. And uh, Reverend George, God bless you, good to see you. Reverend Chadwick, amen. Preacher here, preacher there, preacher everywhere, amen. God bless you. Uh, are you there in Mark chapter 15? Amen. Amen. Now, hold that passage, and then I, I want you to turn over and uh, look at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And don't lose the Mark passage, because we're going to look at both at the same time. Mark chapter, six, Mark chapter 15, and then Romans, we're looking at Romans chapter 16. Now, if you get to Romans, say amen. Amen. All right. Now, once you're holding Romans chapter 16, I want you now to look back at the passage in Mark chapter 15, and it's just one verse that I would like you to consider with me. Verse 21. There you'll find these words, Mark chapter 15, verse 21. 
And they compelled one named Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Romans chapter 16, if you would look then at verse 13, just one verse, it says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. And Mark 15, again, verse 21. And they compelled one named Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. I want to offer as a subject this morning, the subject, the testimony of a changed man. The testimony of a changed man. Will you pray with me? Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. God grant that anointing that makes preaching possible, that makes preaching practical, that makes preaching personal, but most of all, that makes preaching powerful. Do it all in the matchless, marvelous, majestic, magnanimous name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. The people who love God said together, Amen. Amen. Good morning. My name is Simon. I want to thank Bishop Moore for although he was invited to preach this morning, he decided to step aside and let me give my testimony. The reason this is significant is because it was actually this weekend, back in the year 33 AD, it was the same dates, April the 3rd through the 5th in 33 AD, that my life was changed. And so Bishop Moore said, this is too significant of an anniversary to let it pass by without me having an opportunity to travel all the way from heaven to give you my personal testimony. So I want to start by saying, giving honor to God, the saints and friends gathered here today. I want to thank the Lord for waking me up this morning, starting me on my way, clothing me in my right mind, putting food on my table, because I know that God is able. You need to know that my name is Simon, and I'm from a place called Cyrene. You would know it as modern day Libya. It is on the northern coast of Africa, right on the Mediterranean Sea. It is about a thousand miles from Jerusalem. I was born and bred in Cyrene, which makes me an African. And I want you to know that I was gifted from my youth. I played on the state championship team for the Cyrenian High School basketball team. In fact, I was the point guard. I had a letter uh, earned in basketball and I received a full scholarship to the University of Alexandria where I graduated summa cum laude with a degree in economics. I met my uh, wife in high school. We were sweethearts. We went on the prom together was so connected, she had me singing, I got sunshine on a cloudy day. When it's cold outside, I got the month of May. Uh, I guess you say, what makes me feel this way? And I would just say, my girl. Uh, we were blessed to have two sons. Both of them look just like me. The oldest was named Rufus, and the youngest was named we were so connected. Our family was the talk of Serene. In fact, when I graduated from college, I got a degree in the import-export business, and I became financially well off. You might say today I was a baller and a shot caller. I was living large and in charge. I was part of the lifestyle of the 
the rich and the famous. I had it going on. I was wearing tailor-made Hickey Freeman suits. My wife was wearing St. John suits. We were wearing uh, uh, ballet sandals on our feet. I had a Rolex sundial. I was driving a Lexus chariot with straight up. I had to lean to the side. Take it in the scene with the gangster lean. Ooh, ooh. Uh, in fact, uh, life for me was wonderful. We had a split level home in downtown Serene, but I also had a timeshare in Judah, right on the coast of the Mediterranean, that at least once a year during the pilgrimage, I would go to Jerusalem to hang out.
to Jerusalem. I, I, it was a week before Passover because I wanted to spend a good three or four weeks in Jerusalem in my townhouse because then I could just uh, chill. I could just take it easy. And so I happened to be in the vicinity of Jerusalem on April the 3rd, 33 AD. I happened to be on my way to temple. And as I was on my way to temple for the Passover, there was a crowd that was gathering. And I found myself getting caught up in the crowd. Let me just pause parenthetically to say to you, be careful hanging with the crowd. Because not every crowd is a real congregation. Just because you see a whole lot of folk doesn't mean they are about the right thing. And as the crowd was gathering, I really didn't know what was going on. I was really minding my own business. But I heard some things in the crowd that said to me that a crucifixion was going on. That there were three men that were being crucified. So I wanted to see what was going on. I stood there on the periphery of the crowd. And in fact, a few minutes later, along came one man with a cross that he was carrying. Now, I know many of you have seen movies about crosses, but the reality is that they didn't carry the full cross. They just carried the cross beam over their shoulders. One man went by. The second man went by. And then the third man was coming. But as I looked at him, I realized he seemed to have been beaten more viciously than the other two. It was almost as if the soldiers got some perverse pleasure out of beating him. Why was it that he had more lashes across his back? Why was it that he had a crown of thorns on his head which caused blood to come streaming down his face? I was concerned because it seemed to me something was out of order. The law enforcement personnel who were sworn to protect and serve instead were persecuting and scandalizing because they kept calling him names and mocking him. It made me feel a sense of protest. I wanted to shout out, no justice, no peace. I wanted to declare, hands up, don't crucify. I wanted to start a movement, hashtag Black Lives Matter. I wanted somebody to get a t-shirt that said I can't breathe. But I stood there in my agony over what was happening and all of a sudden a Roman centurion pointed to me and took a spear out and said, you, you from Africa, you pick up the cross for this man because he can't carry it any longer. It bothered me because I wanted to know why me? Why they picked me out with out of this whole crowd? Uh, but uh, then I realized uh, why not me? For the fact of the matter is in this day that I've been watching in 2015, I've been watching you from heaven and I see a lot of this uh, that goes on in church. Just name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, to anoint it, to be disappointed, too blessed to be stressed. I've heard a lot of this cotton candy preaching that goes on behind some of these plexiglass pulpits with preachers wearing $1,500 suits and alligator shoes and smiling all the time. I've seen that because you think now that if you're blessed, it means you don't have to go through anything. You think that if you're blessed, it means you don't have to have struggle. 
happened to me. As I was getting weary, I would find myself falling closer to Jesus. And I realized that when I slipped back from Jesus, I was more exhausted. But as I got close to him, I got more strength. I realized the principle then, the closer to him I get, the better I feel. And I need to encourage somebody who's carrying a burden, who's dealing with some problems, whose finances are fractured, whose money is funny, whose change is strange, who feels the burdens of life. Don't stop coming to church. Don't give up on them as they laid the cross beam down and then they laid Jesus on the cross. I've seen some of these crucifixes and some of these pictures and you show little dots of blood in the palm of the hands. But I've come to tell you I was there. They didn't put the nails through the palm of the hands because if they had put his nails through the palm of his hands the weight of his body would have uh, from his hand. They put those spikes into his wrist and blood came gushing forth. They took a great big, what would look like a railroad spike and put it uh, and nailed it in his feet. And then they made a mistake because when Jesus was on the ground, it was one thing. But then should have lifted him up. They should have left him laying on the ground because when they lifted him up, the earth began to shake. When they lifted him up, dead folk got up out of the grave. When they lifted him up, lightning began to flash. When they lifted him up, thunder began to roar. When they lifted him up, the sun stopped shining. It was almost as if the S-U-N said, I cannot shine because of the you 
without really getting to know you. Pilate kept asking, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus just simply said, you say that I am. Well, Pilate condemned Jesus to death without getting to know him. I learned that folk will judge you with only a little bit of the information. Folk don't really know you. Of God. 
when they thought he was dead, they needed to make sure. And so they took a spear and they thrust it into his side. And blood poured out everywhere. And some of it splashed on me. In the moment it splashed on me, I felt a change in my life.
Jesus. And 